Hi, Jeff Rick here with theCUBE. We're having a CUBE conversation here in the Palo Alto offices, uh, and we love to get you know, founders of companies and, and, and really hear and t bring to you what's going on here in, in Silicon Valley. It's an exciting time, and I'm, I'm really excited for this next segment. Joined by a longtime friend, we were just talking off camera, I think I've known Ben for almost 20 years, Ben Chung, the co-founder and CEO of Genie. Ben, welcome. Thank you, glad to be here. Absolutely, so I want to give everybody just kind of a quick update. What is Genie? Genie is a scheduling service but it's completely powered by artificial intelligence. It uh, plugs into your messaging system so that you can um, call upon it to get a meeting schedule and it gets it done instantaneously right away. And um, you know, just like a real assistant would. So Genie's one of these great little applications. It seems like a very simple process, scheduling meetings, right? Mm -hmm. It's a nightmare that we all have to do all the time. Turns out it's not a simple process at all, as a human or as a, as a computer. And as we were talking before, the value of getting meetings done well, done right, done efficiently is actually really high mm -hmm. and much greater than people probably perceive it to be. Mm -hmm. So it's a great problem space for you guys to attack, but you're attacking it a little bit different because as you said, scheduling has been around forever. So mm -hmm. what are you guys doing different uh, at Genie? Yeah. Um, the big thing that I think many people have tried, um, you know, I think there was a company um, pretty well known called um, Tango that people love that tried it before but didn't really go very far. I think what what's really different right now is that the artificial intelligence technology behind that is already reached a level of sophistication to a degree that we can actually impersonate a person that so that we can have Genie plug into your email or your messaging system, for example and you can just use natural language in English, tell Genie to schedule a meeting. And Genie can actually take a look at your calendar and also consult your invitees and take a look at their availability and actually come out with a meeting time and get that book on your calendar instantaneously. So we believe that what people has been missing is really that simple, easy experience where you just tell Genie to do it, Genie would just do it. Like, like you have a admin. Right, that would, right. That would cost a lot of money. To and do. a lot of people are familiar with Siri, right? It's probably mm -hmm. their first mm -hmm. kind of interaction or at scale interaction with kind of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So what are the things that you can do with that type of, of horsepower, both on the hardware side, Ben and I used to work with big horsepower microprocessors back in the mm -hmm. Intel days, you know, both on, the, on the, the hardware side, but then also on the software side that you just couldn't do before the way that you do it now with really natural language. Yeah, um, I think the big, um, yeah, like people, like you mentioned, most people have um, experience with natural language processing through Siri or Google Now. I think many people, quite honestly, have not had the best experience there because the issue is <laughs> that it, they try to m make it look like you can do so many different things, uh, but in fact, the, te the artificial intelligence technology is not there yet to be able to really act like a compu complete human. So the way that we approach it is say, let's kind of see if we can focus the context on just scheduling meetings. Can you build a, simulate a person that understands scheduling meetings so well and understands the language around scheduling meetings so well that it can actually, under, you know, gets you, you know, perfect meeting times and understands you perfectly? Versus sometimes you tell Siri to do something it doesn't understand. Right, right. So it's very similar analogy to like, if you say like, can I buy a robot today that does all the house cleaning and does everything? No, but you can buy a robot that only does full cleaning, and it does it pretty well for a reasonable price. Right. And that's kind of the way we, th we think the AI technology is today with the service kind of work like scheduling meetings. Right, and you talk about it on the, on the website at, at genie.me, you know, the language that you use. It's coffee meetings, it's a breakfast meeting, mm -hmm. right? It's a hangout, it's, a, it's lunch. It's mm -hmm. like regular language, and mm -hmm. it's this week or next week, you know, really using that natural language. How, is, in your experience, um, when people use it, Right, I'm sure people say, well, there's no way this can work. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see their behavior changing after they interact with the application a little bit? Yeah, actually the interesting thing that we find is that when we started building the system, we say, well, it has to be like taking account all the corner cases. Who knows what people would say? And who knows what exactly they would, um, the way that they would express themselves to, to Genie to get a meeting schedule. Actually, what we find is that people are like creature of habits. So once they start telling Genie in a certain way that they like, and they just keep doing it consistently. So in a way that the artificial intelligence layer, yes, it requires some kind of good amount of sophistication, 
but it's not wild. It's not crazy. Right. You know, we tend to be like creature of habits, and we you know use similar vocabularies that other people use. So that part, you know, it took a little bit of time, but it, it wasn't like insurmountable. Right, and we talk a lot about in this machine learning space about machines starting to teach themselves. Mm -hmm. Where are you guys on that kind of journey in terms of how much of it do you have to teach? How much mm -hmm. does it pick up on its own? How does mm -hmm. that kind of get sorted out? We are still at this stage where we're more focused on we are teaching the machine the human sensibility so that when it comes out with a meeting time, it doesn't seem like irrational to the person that is serving. So the teaching aspect is still more predominant right now because we are a small company who's starting out. Um, we can see the learning aspect become more and more predominant as we have more users mm -hmm. and we get to know the users more intimately, right. just like a real person would. And we can start using you know, their habits and the learnings and maybe start applying it to similar demographics. Right. Now the next thing is, is uh, we talked a little bit uh, offline, is really y how you're able to build on the backs of a lot of other technologies that's out there, specifically mm -hmm. obviously mobile mm -hmm. and cloud mm -hmm. and big data mm -hmm. and APIs, right? Because mm -hmm. you know usually within uh, kind of a typical world, an Outlook world or even a Google Calendar mm -hmm. world, you know you have to grant people access to your calendar and there's mm -hmm. this whole, do I p let people in my calendar? Mm -hmm. I'd love for them to see my business stuff, but I don't want them to see mm -hmm. when I'm going to the dentist. Mm -hmm or whatever, how do you deal with kind of the whole permissions and, and how does the application actually interact with someone who maybe that you don't, they don't have access to the shared calendar? Right, yeah. I think that's one of the great things that have been happening out there in the industry is that pretty much any service that you, that are available out there, they have built pretty good APIs and I have to kind of commend Google for doing this. For, for example, for Google calendars, it actually gives, gives very, very good APIs that have good level control, such that we can just ask for just the bare minimum permission that we require and make it clear, and then it's a one-click solution, one-click experience for the user to grant us that permission, and thereafter, we can just kind of pull everybody's calendar availability together and come up with the best time for you. Versus before, first of all, you can't even access people's calendar because they're right. stored away in a server somewhere that are blocked by firewall. Um, and we, even if you can access, there is no API for it. But now, even with Exchange Calendar, Google Calendar, even Apple iCloud Cloud Calendar, there is APIs available, and we spend a whole lot of time engineering ourselves, um, you know, against those systems, so that we can provide a very simple experience for the users. Right, right. And then what about kind of some of the softer nuances within calendaring in terms of, you know, I don't want to do it right after I get back from lunch in mm -hmm. case I'm running late mm -hmm. or. Uh, conflicks, back-to-back, mm -hmm. back, mm -hmm. time zones. How about all those types of nuances? How do you work with those? Yeah, um, those are the some of the things that we did extensive training to the AI system. And we actually trained ourselves by interviewing a lot of admins who are really good at scheduling those, uh, scheduling meetings and mm -hmm. who, you know, who gets really good praises from the executives that they serve. So we kind of learned some of those nuances about like, for example, you probably don't want to schedule a meeting right at nine o'clock because sometimes traffic people run late. You don't want to schedule a meeting um, in late in the afternoon right before people leave for work because they want to wrap a few things up and they don't want to kind of just go off and then have to rush out to, do, to their car. So we take a lot of those kind of nuances. You probably don't schedule a meeting back to back you know, in a row with four different meetings and exhaust um, as, you know, your executive out. So we take a lot of those into account. We, we have like probably thousands of algorithms that weigh the different things, time zones, and what if you have this special circumstance with the time zone and, you know, that, you know, it's right next to your lunch slot, what would you do? So we did a lot of analysis and kind of train the machine to make the right decision. Excellent, so just uh, before we get off this topic, where do people go to, uh, to sign up? Yeah, it's just simple. Um, you know, just go to genie.me, G-E-N-E dot M-E. Okay. And we'll get you going. Simple. So now I want to shift gears a little bit. Like I said, we've known each other for a long time. You were at Intel, VMware. You've, you've been around the block in the valley, mm -hmm. hardware, mm -hmm. software. Mm -hmm. And then you decided to go out on your own. Talk mm -hmm. a bit about how you came to that decision. What was it that, that kind of pushed you from the comfort of ESOPs and, uh, and everything kind of taken care of to, to this kind of bold new adventure that, that really powers Silicon Valley? Is it's guys like you that are leaving the comforts of of uh, successful companies to, to branch out and do your own thing. Yeah, I think I have to kind of attribute that to the you know Silicon Valley culture here, where you know start you know going out and taking risk is not you know something that would be viewed as dumb later on. And if you didn't succeed, it's actually a badge of honor rather than saying that like you're completely failure. So some of that culture here really kind of helps a lot in terms of helping make a decision. 
the other thing that I kind of learned from the process is that for people that haven't gone into it, you think about it, you always stop with the financial questions like, well, what if this happened and I have no income for this amount of time, this and that. And actually, the, the thing that I learned from it is that after starting the company, I realized that, you know what, the job market is so good here and you know, if you have technical talent, it, you, you are so, in so much demand, the, the financial question is actually more. It's, it's really a, a question about are you, are you willing to take on the challenge? Are you going to be persistent enough to take on the challenge? You know, you, do you have enough courage to carry it through when it looks like it's going to hell? <laughs> you know, w would you be able to do that or are you going to just give up? You're going to be crying. You know, would you be able to always be optimistic and just say, I'm going to just like, make it happen no matter what? I think that is kind of, to me, like after starting a company, it's like a growing up experience. Right. You know, to say, I, I felt like I finally grew up. Right. That's funny. Um, I wanted to shift gears talk a little bit about Wharton. We both went to Wharton together, and it's just funny you say that. When I worked at the uh, Entrepreneur Center at school, we would have these local entrepreneurs come in, and I, I basically always tried to talk them out of it mm -hmm. um, as, as aggressively as I could. And then at the end of the meeting, I would say, wow, if I can talk you out of it after 10 minutes of not knowing anything about your topic, you probably shouldn't go into it because mm -hmm. you don't have the perseverance to really push it on through because that's a hard part. Mm -hmm. So talk about uh, business school. Um, mm -hmm. Was it a good thing to do? Is it a bad thing to do? I think a lot of people always wonder, should I go to business school? Is there a mm -hmm. good ROI? Mm -hmm. Now that you've been out of it for a while, you've, you've, you've done some big companies, you've done some little companies, mm -hmm. looking back, was it the right decision? Yeah, I think that is a, I don't think there is a right answer for everybody per se. I mean, for me personally, I do feel like it's the right, it's the right decision, but the way that I look at it is not about economics. I mean, because economics is really hard to attribute, like, you know, I I got a certain amount of income from this job. Was it because of the business school? Because or wasn't? Or it wasn't? I think it's really. I, looking back, this what what do you feel like you had? What kind of experience that you had? First of all, did you have? Did, did you look get, look back and say, well, I have really found memories of that two those two years I spent over there at Warren. Or number one, so I do feel that I have that. And secondly, is that do you feel like at that time it really kind of helped you to build your skill set as a person? You know, and yeah, maybe some of those skills will yield to big monetary, you know, rewards. Some of them don't. Maybe just make you a better person, you know, more approachable by people and understand broader set of topics better. I felt that yes, to for me, that definitely helped in terms of like, you know, giving me the broader skill set that I need as a founder of a company. Excellent. So before we go, I'm going to give you the last word. What are you excited about? What are some of the next uh, kind of hurdles you're trying to to climb uh, over the next several months? Yeah, we're just coming out of stealth mode right now. So what's really exciting is really kind of start opening the genie up to the whole wide world of people. We have people from, you know, from non-English speaking countries using genie, and I, I really didn't expect that. But now they're on the system, so we have to figure out how to, you know, make it work for them. So I think what's exciting is really, you know, suddenly we get the exposure to this broader set of people, and you're seeing the metrics ramping up and you kind of frantically just make it work. Make it work like you, like you promised. That's great. Well, thanks, Ben, for stopping by. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So I'm Jeff Frick. He's Ben Chung with Jeannie. You're watching Cube Conversations. Thanks for watching.